it is way too cold outside to do another opening, so instead we'll just stay inside and do some time series. Today in our time series lecture, we'll be continuing the theory that we did with the autoregressive and the moving average process. We're going to cram them together, and what are we going to get? Well, the ARMA model, the autoregressive moving average process. Um, we'll also look at the ARIMA model, the autoregressive integrated moving average process. Um, and this will give us a lot more theory to understand how these tools work before we get into the actual statistics of trying to estimate and fit data to such things. So let's go take a look at that. And we're back with yet another lecture of STAT 479 time series analysis. In this lecture, we're going to continue the theory that we were doing in the previous lecture. That is, last time we went through the AR and the MA process individually. Now we're going to combine it and look at the ARMA process, and then we'll go on to looking at the ARIMA process. So we have another day with a bit of theory to get through, but um, after that we'll take a little break and we'll look at some actual data now that we have sort of a new understanding of the AR, MA, ARMA, and ARIMA models. So let's get into that. Right. Well, what I'd like to do first is just kind of recap what we did last time because there's a lot of stuff in there and I want to make sure that uh, we kind of remember what we did. Uh, so first of all, we have, um, we discussed the AR or autoregressive process. I should say ARP, order P. And what we learned about that is, well, first of all, how to define it. We defined it in terms of its um, the autoregressive operator, which is capital Phi of B applied to XT, and that's going to equal WT, uh, white noise. So this is the sort of general form for our autoregressive process of order P. Um, and what we found is that, um, basically the key thing that we discovered is that this is causal in the sense that it can be written as a causal linear process um, if the uh, roots, the polynomial roots, or the I guess the roots of the polynomial, well, I'm not going to say of the polynomial, but the roots of capital Phi evaluated Z for Z a complex number lie outside the unit disk. That is their magnitude, the magnitude of all of the roots, let's say Ri is going to be greater than one. This is for all I. So what does that look like in a picture? Well, in a picture, if we imagine the complex plane, here we got the reals and we've got the, I guess, imaginary in this axis. Then what we have is we have our unit disk, approximately a circle there. Um, and the roots should be outside of the unit disk. Maybe they're also on the other side, but as long as they lie outside the unit disk, we have a causal ARP process. Um, if it has P terms, then it's ARP. But if all the roots lie outside, then we have a causal autoregressive process. Great. Um, if we have roots lying on the disk, then we run into the non-stationarity issue. If we have roots within the unit disk, then we have a non-causal process. It may very well be stationary, as we discussed last time. Um, you can have the case where the process explodes, um, but it's still technically a stationary non-causal process. So yeah, time series is a bit weird, right? Um, you look at the data and you think, oh yeah, it's just uh, watching something over time. And then you realize, ah, there's actually a lot of crazy math going on. Um, but anyway, yeah, so that's the ARP, the autoregressive order P process. Um, now, if we move on, we can, we also discussed last time the MA order Q process, the moving average process of order Q. 
And uh, similarly, this was defined to be xt is equal to capital theta b applied to wt. So really, it's the same thing as before, except we're applying the operator to the white noise rather than applying the operator to xt. Um, in this case, we had a very similar development, um, but we're going to change the word causal to invertible, and that is that this is invertible, invertible, um, if the roots of uh, theta evaluated at some complex number z um, are greater than one in magnitude as we just discussed um, with the autoregressive process. Um, so what we have here, right, is that we have really the same setup. We're saying that if the roots are at, lie outside the unit disk, then it's invertible. So what is invertible? Invertible means that we can write um, WT in terms of some type of a series uh, let's see, we need, let's say, j from, I guess, 1 to 0 to infinity of, I forget what the coefficients I used. I think they were, were they thetas? I'm trying to keep the notation the same. Um, we'll just use, no, I don't want to use theta because theta is the actual coefficient. We'll use phi, even though I think, um, no, phi, psi, we'll use psi. The little one that looks like a trident. There we go. We'll use psi j. Um, what are we doing? X t minus j. So the idea being that we can, like we had the linear process, maybe I can write that up above here in green. So for our linear process, right, we would have x t, um, which is the sum of, let's say, t from. Uh, I guess zero to infinity. I'm going to use psi again. Um, not t. Sorry, what am I doing? I am getting my indices all backwards today. Um, we have psi i, and then we have w t minus i. So in this case, the size in the green and the size in the blue might be different values. But the point is that um, really, if a process is causal then it means I can write xt as a sum of white noise from present all the way into the past, right? If a process is invertible, then I can write the white noise as a sum of the xt's, the pro of the, the process itself, um, with some coefficients going, I guess, off into the past as well. So that's roughly, and they both correspond to the same idea, which is we need these roots for the polynomial to lie outside of the unit disk. Uh, so it becomes an exercise in, uh, I guess, complex, I don't want to say analysis, complex algebra, um, where you're trying to factor a polynomial over the uh, complex numbers. Luckily, computers do that all for you, so uh, we don't have to worry too much. But the idea that we got to last time is that when we actually want to do things like estimation, um, we need to know what we're estimating, and you can have invertible, non-invertible equivalent processes, and you can have causal, non-causal equivalent processes. So we have to know which one we're going to estimate, um, and typically the ones we want are going to be the causal and the invertible ones. And that is going to lead us into the ARMA model. So we have now the ARMA PQ model. Now, the ARMA PQ model is kind of what you think it's going to be. You're going to take the ARP, the MAQ, and you're going to cram them together and you get an ARMA model. Um, but we will take the time to carefully write this all out. Um, I mean, I could just leave it at that, say, and say, OK, you cram them together and we're done. Um, but it is good to write this all out in finer detail because I know that probably you're all learning the theory for the first time. Um, so it's really good to take some time and slowly work your way through it wonder if that's being picked up by the mic. Sounds like there's a sad toddler upstairs. Anyway, um, right, so if we want to define an ARMA PQ process, 
then again, we say that xt has zero mean, which is really, again, just for convenience, as we talked about last time, uh, we just have the zero mean there so that we don't have to be dragging around this extra term, which is super annoying. Um, so we assume it has zero mean, we can adjust it otherwise, and we're going to write xt in, well, a couple different ways. The first way we're going to do it is say it's going to be white noise at current time t plus some type of auto regressive summation in terms of the phi's <laughs> t minus i. Um, and we're going to have some j here running from 1 to q of theta j w t minus j. Um, so now what we have here is we basically have exactly what we had before. We have the ARP piece and we have the MAQ piece. Now uh, we have a couple assumptions. So we have our coefficients. <laughs> oh man, we have our coefficients um, phi one through phi p and theta one through theta q. These are all assumed or they're all going to be real numbers. Um, and specifically, we want to make sure that phi p is not zero and theta q, that's a terrible theta, let's do that again, theta q is also not zero um, because otherwise it wouldn't be an arm of pq it would be an arm of some other order p prime q prime uh, process so again that's the the mathematical setup and we can also write i'll say we also write phi b x t is equal to theta b w t. So we just take the two things that we had above here, um, that is specifically this piece and this piece, and then we cram them together and we get this guy here, um, which really just says we have an autoregressive operator, apply it to x t. We have a moving average operator, apply it to w t. And anyway, um, you have all these pieces. So this is what the auto regressor, the uh, yeah, the auto regressive moving average process is going to look like. Now there's some interesting little things that can occur. Um, the first is going to be a problem of uniqueness, or more more so, non uniqueness. So there's a chance that, uh, well, not a chance. Um, if you have an ARMA model, you could actually write it in, I guess, effectively an infinite different number of ways. There's going to be the best way to write it. Um, but the point is that, um, well, let's look at an example. Um, so the example we have here is going to be that xt is going to be theta x t minus 1 minus theta w t minus 1 plus w t. So if I gave you this process, the first thing we'd look at and say, ah, okay, this looks a lot like uh, ARMA. I see one moving average term and one um, autoregressive term, so it looks kind of like an ARMA 1, 1. I'll say, right? Um, Right when you first look at this, it looks a lot like that. But let's move some of the pieces around and see what happens. Well, in this case, if we if we try to write it in that form above, what we actually get is we get something that's going to look like one minus theta b applied to x t, um, and we're also going to get a let's say a one minus theta b applied to w t. Ah. Okay, so we actually have the same um, operator on each side. So what we really want to do is we want to cross these out and be done and basically say xt is equal to wt. So in this case, and I should say, 
actually I should make that more precise here. First of all, can cancel if theta in absolute value is less than one. Otherwise, uh, you can't necessarily divide by it because the power series will have a radius of convergence that is smaller than one, so it doesn't work. But in the case that theta here is less than one, you can cancel out both of these and you end up with just xt equals wt. And that means um, it's actually white noise. So it turns out that uh, this ARMA11 process that I wrote down is not really an ARMA11 process. It's actually just white noise in disguise. And that's the idea that because you effectively have two polynomials, you have the phi on the left, you've got theta on the right. If they have common roots, that is, if there are common terms um, in those polynomials, you can feasibly cancel them out on each side and reduce the process from an ARMA pq to an arma p prime q prime for p i guess p minus one q minus one if you reduce it by one term um so that's another key thing and it's a good little exercise to go through because um again if you're trying to estimate terms in a model right you could try to estimate the, the terms and find that you just get white noise out or if you try to estimate fit an arma 1 1 process to the same white noise well you might actually do that but you're going to end up with um, coefficients of theta whatever theta is um, in this case theta is not even unique it could be any theta as long as theta is less than one in magnitude so um, again, this makes the problem of estimation very tricky because we want to make sure that we estimate something that's in some sort of reduced form um, and we want to be able to do that uniquely. So that's just one of the um, there we go. That's just one of the headaches that can arise when you're dealing with um, ARMA, uh, an ARMA process. So basically what I'll say is in general, I should write this out in general before we move on. In general, if theta, or let's say eta, let's say we have a to b, phi b xt is equal to um, eta b theta b wt, then I can cancel the eta's if eta b is invertible. And I know operators like this may be a little bit new to a lot of you going through this course. Um, but what you've probably seen, I'm, I'm assuming you've definitely seen, is some linear algebra. And you could have a matrix, right? And if, let's say, forget about operators and backshift operators, if these were just matrices, then eta could be a matrix. And if I'm multiplying on the left by the same matrix on each side of the equation, I could feasibly cancel it out but only if it's invertible. If it's not invertible, then it's like dividing by zero on both sides of the equation. It doesn't work. Um, so I can't do that. But assuming that the common factors eta are in fact invertible, then I could feasibly cancel them out on both sides of the equation and reduce the ARMA model to a lower order. So Again, little things to be aware of um, when you're dealing with such um, objects mathematically. All right, so what does that mean? That means, therefore, we assume that phi of z as a polynomial and theta of z are I'll say relatively prime in the sense that they do not have, they don't have common uh, factors, or in this case, common roots. Roots. 
So now we have one more condition for our armor process. So if we go back up, I'm just going to scroll up and not draw it again. If we go back up to our unit circle here, we want to make sure that the roots of phi lie outside the disk. We want to make sure the roots of theta lie outside the disk, and we want to make sure they don't have any common roots. So they have to have a unique set, uh, unique sets of, uh, or a unique collection of roots. The roots have to be unique between the two of them. Yeah, you could have a double root, I guess, within the same. I don't want to make sure that's clear. You could have a double root. Um, or a higher multiplic multiplicity for a root within one of the polynomials phi or theta, but you don't want to have a, um, a common root between the two of them. All right, so if all of this is true, then we have some different ways of writing the process out. So, so now with the um, form here that phi b applied to xt is equal to theta b applied to wt we say that if theta b is invertible then well what we can do is we can write um, wt as phi b divided by theta b all applied to um, x t, which is going to be um, kind of the invertible way to write this process. Ah, that was the notation I used before was pi. Now I remember. So what we can, no, not x t. What it's going to look like is something like x t plus the sum j from 1 to infinity of pi j x t minus j. So the idea again is that um, because we assume that theta is invertible, then this infinite sum, this infinite summation makes sense in the, case, in the sense that the pi's will decay to zero fast enough. I mean, more explicitly, I should say, I can suggest I can hand wave it and say they go to zero really fast, but more precisely, what I should say is that the sum of the pi's j from one to infinity, I should say the sum of the absolute value is finite. So they are absolutely summable. Absolutely summable. All right. And that's going to be the property that we need here i mean well that's that's basically what invertibility will imply so once again we make the um the uh claim that um basically the arma arm arma pq is invertible uh, and this is, I guess, if and only if all roots of theta, let's say Z, are outside of the disk, the unit disk. And we can actually prove that, which we're going to look at in a second. But what I'm also going to do is write the complementary, um, the uh, complementary property, which is the causality um, for um, phi. So what I'll say is similarly, similarly, right? We say that if uh, how do we want to write this? I guess if um, phi b is invertible, we can write invertible in the sense of an, an invertible operator. Then we can write that um, x t is going to be capital theta b divided by capital phi b applied to wt and we can write that 
in terms of a causal linear process, which is going to look like j from 1 to infinity of psi j uh, w t minus j. So now what we're doing is we're saying that um, basically, if I can if I can divide by capital phi, if it has an inverse that makes sense, um, then I can end up writing out my ARMA process as a causal linear process, right? And this is where the sum j from one to infinity of the absolute value of the phi's. I think. Oh yeah, no, we already assumed that. Yeah, good, we're good um is finite so again this is again absolutely summable which basically means the terms the phi the psi the psi no the psi the ones that look like the trident the psi go to zero really fast um, they have to go to zero really fast if they're going to be summable in absolute value um that way you don't have any of those issues with like um, conditional convergence or conditional summability if they had alternating signs or anything weird like that. We need a much stronger condition, which is they um, sum up in, um, in their magnitudes like that. Okay, so we have that good summability condition on the um, phi or the psi. Ah, keep doing that. All right, we're going to get through this. We're going to get through this. So what we're going to do now is we're going to, well, I'm going to write down the result and then I'm going to reset things and we're going to actually prove it. So what we're going to say is that, um, yeah, basically the next thing we're going to do is prove that an ARMA PQ is causal if and only if um, the roots of phi by z are such that I guess ri is less than one or no not less than one greater than one in magnitude not the clearest of sentences r such that <laughs> r is greater than one um, but that's the idea as long as we're going to try to show this uh rigorously rather than me just kind of hand waving and saying ah yeah i can divide by phi and then this all kind of makes sense um so we're going to do this for causality and if you wanted to show this for invertibility it's going to be more or less the exact same argument just swapping phi for theta and the word causal for invertible but we're going to take a quick break and when we get back we are going to prove that claim so let's do that all right and we're back and we're going to now try to prove this uh claim about the uh, arma process being causal so we're going to have to do an if and only if proof which means we have to do it both ways um so the first thing we're going to do is say for the proof is going to be let um we're going to try to do this rigorously let phi z phi of z have roots r1 through rp and they're going to be complex numbers they're going to lie somewhere in the complex plane um, so first we're going to assume that um so we first which way is this going to be going this is the reverse direction yeah so we're going to prove the reverse direction terrible error let's try that again there we go so we're going to prove the reverse direction first which is to say assume that r i is greater than one for all i equal let's say one to p just to be precise about it um okay so let's assume that and then we want to show that this arma process has a causal as a representation as a causal linear process so let's see how do we do that well first 
um, we say that, okay, if we assume that, then we'll say without loss of generality, w log, um, dot, 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 dot. So without loss of generality, assume the roots are ordered. Well, how are they ordered, right? We can't, we don't have a natural ordering um, on the complex plane like we would on the real line. We assume that they're ordered in their magnitude. So what I mean by that is that we have one, I guess you could define orderings on the complex plane. So I shouldn't say there is no natural ordering, but it's not as straightforward how to, what the ordering should be, but it doesn't really matter. I'm just rambling. What we really want is we want to say that the roots from one to uh, P are going to be in increasing order. So they could be equal to each other. That's why I have the less than or equal to sign. But most critically, they have to all be strictly greater than one. So we have to make sure that they are all greater than one. But then after that, they could equal each other. They could all be the same or they could all be different. Doesn't really matter. We just have to assume there's some ordering and without loss of generality, they're indexed in the in their natural um, increasing order. Um, so given this, we say let the uh, magnitude of R1 be 1 plus epsilon. This is for some epsilon greater than 0. Some epsilon greater than 0. Um, so what does this mean? Well, this implies, therefore, we should say, we have that phi inverse of z um, exists with a power series representation, a power series representation um, with radius of convergence. radius it's all about the radius of convergence here right with radius of convergence uh, i guess less than or radius of convergence of i guess one plus epsilon which means that well if i write i can write it out here the inverse phi inverse of z can be written as an infinite sum. I'm going to use the coefficient a, aj from 1 to or 0 to infinity, z to the j power, the jth power. So what it means is that I can write the inverse. Remember, phi is just a polynomial. It's a complex polynomial. And if I know that the smallest root in magnitude is going to have value a magnitude, I should say one plus epsilon, then what that means is that I can write this inverse in terms of a power series, and the radius of convergence is going to be one plus epsilon, which means, right, let me just make that explicit. I'll say, i.e., if um, z in magnitude is less than one plus epsilon, then this guy converges I guess absolutely, I believe, is the correct way to say it. Though, yeah, no, that makes sense. Okay, good. So that's basically what, what's going on here. Um, now, what do we do next? Well, okay, that's, that's just sort of uh, dealing with power series and uh, complex numbers. Um, next, we choose a delta where delta is going to be i need another a little bit more room here we need to choose a delta that's between zero and epsilon strictly so it's still a positive number but it also has to be less than epsilon and luckily we have real numbers so we can definitely find some delta that lies in between zero and epsilon um, then choosing z to be 1 plus delta, we have that z 
is inside the radius of convergence. Okay. So then what are we doing with that thing? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to plug it into the series and we're going to move some terms around to see what happens. Um, so let's scroll this up. We'll say, therefore, if I evaluate my polynomial phi at 1 plus z, or not 1 plus z, at z, which is going to be 1 plus delta, um, because that's how I chose it to be, um, then what I end up with is something that's going to look like the sum j from 0 to infinity of aj 1 plus delta to the jth power. And because it's within the radius of convergence, we know that that sum is finite. We don't know what it is, but we know it's finite. So that's all that really matters for our purposes now. Because again, what we're trying to show is that our ARMA process has a causal, is a representation as a causal linear process. So that's what we're kind of fighting our way to through all of these derivations, um, which means ultimately we want to show that something is summable. Um, right, so what do we do next? Well, because this thing sums, uh, is summable, we say, therefore, there exists a C a constant greater than zero. This is some constant. So there exists a constant C greater than zero um, such that these coefficients here, aj1 plus delta to the j, have to be less than C. Right, remember this series, uh, this series here is convergent. That means that the terms, the summands, summands, I believe is the right word, the terms in the series have to get smaller and smaller and smaller. They could get big and in, in, in a, they could get large in a finite sense and then decay. But in the long run, these terms have to go to zero or else we're not, and they have to go to zero pretty fast, um, or else this thing is not going to sum up, is not going to converge. So all we're saying is, is that because we know that this series converges, we know that there's going to be an upper bound. This infinite series of coefficients or this infinite sequence of coefficients of um, terms in the series has to have an upper bound. We're going to define that upper bound to be C. Or it has to have just some upper bound. It doesn't have to be like a sharp upper bound by any means. And this is, I should say, for all J. Okay, so now that we have that, we just rearrange the term slightly and we say once again, I'll do more three more dots and say therefore, therefore, and therefore, we have that the absolute value of aj is bounded above by c 1 plus delta to the minus j. So what we have here is we have an upper bound on how fast or how I guess an upper bound on how slowly the AJs can go to zero and they have to go to zero in this geometric fashion of with a rate of one plus delta. So what this is telling us is, you know, just how fast or slow the AJs go to zero. So that's what we're really doing here. We're saying because this series is uh, it, um, because this series is this sums up. It has a finite sum. We know that the AJs have to go to zero at a certain rate, um, at least at a certain rate, because otherwise it wouldn't make sense. So what does this all mean? <laughs> so all of this implies that, well, what? It implies that um, we can take our ARMA model, um, which is going to look like this. And what we can do is we can rearrange the terms to get something that's going to look like xt is going to be equal to phi inverse b 
theta b w t. And uh, what that means is that we can actually write this out as a um, causal linear process in this form. Phi j w t minus j. And as the aj's are absolutely summable, A ball. I'll say so are the psi j's because you can actually write the um, can we do that is that going to be a pain to do let's see if we can actually do that um, you should be able to write the psi j's in terms of the aj's and the thetas right because I think if we go all the way back to the beginning the AJs at the top of the screen here um, are going to, they're going to be the coefficients for phi inverse. So what we're basically saying, uh, let's write that out just to make sure we got some time. So let's write that out. Um, what we're saying is, is that if we have something like phi inverse of B theta B, then what we're really saying is that we have, well, the product of two sums. We have a sum here, j, from, I guess we were going zero. Let me double check. We have zero to infinity. Sometimes it's zero, sometimes it's one. It's always good to uh, double check to make sure I don't get that wrong. So we're summing aj, bj, or b to the j, pow jth power. And then we have... I think I might have switched my indices, but that's okay. I from, uh, I guess, zero to, in, or not infinity, no. Zero to a Q of theta I B I. So if we were to combine these together, um, well, it's going to be kind of annoying to work out what the terms are, but you're going to get some type of summation i guess we can say j from zero to infinity i from uh zero to q and then we're going to have a coefficient of aj theta i and then bj plus i right so we have something like that and if we really wanted to we can write this i don't really feel like trying to define exactly what phi is, or psi, sorry, psi is, um, because it would be kind of annoying to do so. But um, yeah, the point is, is that we can uh, write it out like that. Since there's only a finite number of thetas, it doesn't really matter. I guess the easiest way would be to just fix a theta and then um, sum up, know that the a's are summable to infinity, um, or absolutely summable, so we're all good to go. Anyway, that's the first half of the proof, right? Which basically says if the roots lie outside the unit disk, then we have this causal rela uh, causal representation of our ARMA process. <sighs> Let's do the reverse now and see how that works. So for the reverse, it's actually the, um, the forward version of the proof based on the way I wrote the statement above. So now we're going to do the same thing, but we're going to do the, um, I guess, the other side of the if and only if. I always forget which way's if and which way's only if. It linguistically never really made a lot of sense to me. Um, anyway, yeah, so what we do is we say let phi of b x t equal theta b w t b and arma p q process that is causal okay so what does that mean well that means exactly how we ended the last proof um i'll say that is we can write x t to be the sum 
Well, I guess what I'll do is I'll take out the W T first. It'll be W T plus the sum of, we'll say J, I'm using J, yeah, from one to infinity of psi J uh, W T minus J. So there's our causal process. Now, what we want to show is we want to show that if this is true, then the roots of phi, I'll write that down just so it's clear. Want to show that the roots of phi are outside the unit disk. I often forget what I'm actually trying to prove when I'm going through a proof like this, so I always have to remind myself, what are we actually trying to do? So we start with the causal process. We want to show that the roots of phi lie outside the unit disk. Okay, so how in the world do we do that? Um, oh, one other thing I need to say. That is this with the psi j from one to infinity, the sum from one to infinity of psi j being finite or again absolutely summable, right? Um, that's the only way these things make sense is if the coefficients decay fast enough um, as they do, as they do by assumption here. All right. So that means we basically can do two things. Well, we write well, two things. We write that xt is going to be what? It's going to be capital psi b of wt. This is, say, causal linear process. Um, and we can also write... Um, phi, capital phi b, x t equal to capital theta b, w t, which is arma, arma p q process. Okay, so now that we have both of these, well, we can actually kind of plug them into each other and see what we get out, right? And what we get out double check to make sure we got this right. Yep. Okay, good. Um, therefore, if I come, well, let me move that. Therefore, if I combine the two of these, what I end up with on the left is I get a phi b applied to a psi b applied to xt. And on the right hand side, I just have my capital theta b applied to wt. So if I take these two and I combine them together, I get this thing. Okay, so where's that going? Well, if we write uh, phi z, do I want z? Yeah, I want z. Psi z to be the sum uh, I, I was using in this case, from one to infinity of a, oh, I did mess up that index. I need to fix that as well in the notes. J from one to infinity of aj, z to the j. Then um, this has a radius of convergence that is greater than one. Okay, so why? Well, I guess it could be greater than or equal to one. Or is it greater than one? No, I think it's greater than or equal to one. Yeah, all the, um, yeah, no, because if it's equal to one, then the root would have to lie outside. It doesn't, no, I'll just say greater than one. That's fine. Um, we don't, yeah, it doesn't really matter. So all the roots are going to be outside of the unit disk. So there's always going to be some one plus epsilon there. So it doesn't really matter. Um, anyway, yeah, so why is that true? Well, it's true because we know that psi 
has is um, ha, um, the coefficients psi are absolutely summable, and phi is a finite polynomial. So, right, this uh, I'm running out of. Uh, well, this polynomial is this is a finite poly, and this guy is absolutely summable. So when I multiply the two of them together, kind of like what I was trying to do up here in blue for uh, phi inverse and theta, um, the same thing applies down here. If I have a finite polynomial in Z and I multiply it by an infinite power series, but with absolutely summable coefficients, then I know that I still get something that's summable. Um, and if the radius of convergence is uh, greater than one for phi, then it's going to be greater than one for phi times for psi. If the radius of convergence is good, these Greek letters, I tell you, right? Um, if the radius of convergence is greater than one for psi, and then I multiply it by a finite polynomial phi, then I'm still going to have a radius of convergence that's greater than one. Whew. Almost going to make it through this. So I'll say hence, we can write, well, the point is I'm going to take um, this thing here. If that arrow is, uh, yeah, that arrow kind of made it. Good. Um, hence what we can do is we can write this as the sum uh, and then we're going to have two things here. We're going to have j from 1 to q of theta j, w t minus j. And we're going to set that equal to the sum j from 1 to infinity of a j, w t minus j, right? Because that's just that equation up above that I have the big green arrow kind of snaking around to get me to. Um, and what it's telling me is that, well, I have two different series in terms of white noise, and they are both equal to each other. So what does that mean? Well, <laughs> the short answer is, therefore, aj is equal to theta j if j is equal to 1 to q and aj has to equal zero otherwise by matching coefficients in that thing. Um, okay, so that kind of makes sense intuitively, right? If I have two series in terms of white noise, um, I have certain coefficients on one side, I have certain coefficients on the other side, it seems intuitively to make sense that I might want to try to match them up. Um, why is that true mathematically, right, is the question we should be asking. Um, it's true mathematically because we can compute the covariance um, of these two, uh, between these two terms. So I'll say this makes sense mathematically. by computing covariances and noting that um, the WTs are uncorrelated. So there is an actual mathematical reason why it makes sense to do that. You can I guess a better intuition would be to note that all the W's, the white noise pieces, are uncorrelated. So um, if I have a W T minus J that has a theta in front of it, and I have a W T minus J with an A in front of it, it turns out those things have to be the same because all the other terms are not going to, in some sense, interact with it in the sum because they're uncorrelated. Now, mathematically, we could actually just write this out. Um, without trying to hand wave it into in, with intuition um, in terms of computing the covariances because if we actually were to compute um, the uh, covariances here 
then we would find out very quickly that we'd have a bunch of linear equations and that the only way it makes sense is to have the thetas and the a's equal to each other given the same index. And then, of course, all the subsequent a, j's being zero. Okay, so what does all of this mean? That means, therefore, so finally, we have that, um, where is it? Capital theta, the polynomial in Z just happens to equal capital phi Z, capital psi Z. Cool. And this is, I should say, for Z within the radius of convergence, but we'll just say less than one because we know the radius of convergence has to be um, at least one. I guess I can say less than or equal to one to be precise. So therefore, um, since none of the roots of psi lie within the disk, by assumption, right? We started this entire second half of the proof by assuming it's a causal, um, yeah, it's a causal process, which means that its roots have to lie outside the unit disk. Um, so we know that that's true. Um, I'll say then, if there is a, I think I used Z naught inside, or I'll just write in the, in the disk, such that um, phi, it is a root of phi such that phi of Z naught is equal to zero, then, well, what does that imply by this equation here that I'm about to, if I can do that, underline in green? Well, what it implies is that then, they, oh, not in green, it implies that theta z naught is also zero, therefore, they have a common root. Root, and this is not, or and therefore not, and arma pq process. And that's where we get our, I guess, uh, contradiction or our, our, our problem here. Since we want to assume, we assumed initially that we had an arma pq process and, uh, oh yes, there goes the camera. Well, I'll just finish the thought process and then we'll reset for the last bit. Um, what I was saying is that um, because what here what we do is we assumed that we had an arm of PQ process, they don't have, they shouldn't have a common root. And the only way that um, a root would exist within the unit disk is if there was a common root among theta and phi, and we would just cancel it out. Therefore, that's not the case. We'll say, therefore, all roots outside unit disk and we can put our little box there and be happy qed <laughs> okay so there is the proof that if we have a causal arma process then the roots of the autoregressive polynomial phi have to lie outside the unit disk and that's if and only if so if the roots lie outside the unit disk we have a causal process if we have a causal process the roots are outside the unit disk now the exact same thought the exact same proof in some sense would work if we wanted to determine if the ARMA process is uh, invertible in terms of using theta. Now, it would be the exact same proof except we'd be swapping the roles of phi and theta, but really everything would be exactly the same. 
Um, so we're not going to go through that, but if you want to work through it yourself just to see if you understand how this um, proof works, that's always a good exercise. For the final piece of this lecture, what I want to do is talk about the ARIMA process. So we're going to go one level deeper into this, and then we'll finally have all of our building blocks for the ARMA, ARMA, ARIMA processes. Um, and then we can actually do some statistics with this perhaps. So uh, like I said, stick with me here because this stuff is kind of uh, dense theoretically, um, but we will eventually get back to statistics. So don't worry, you gotta trust me on that one. Um, right, so before we end this lecture, we still have some time left. So let's talk about the ARIMA process. All right, so what is the ARIMA process? Well, the idea is that, um, so often, I'll say, often XT from wherever XT is coming from, whether it's your stock prices or your COVID cases, your daily temperatures or whatever, um, often XT is not ARMA, P, Q, but is ARMA, yeah, is ARMA P, Q, comma, P, comma, Q with a uh, deterministic, deterministic uh, trend. So what do I mean by that? Well, what I mean is that we might actually have, um, oh, I think I was using W or Y, so I'm going to switch XT to YT. Um, um, for example, EG, we could have YT equal to beta naught plus beta 1T plus XT, where XT is arma PQ. All right. So the idea is that in practice, we very often have some type of a deterministic trend that is the mean of our processes changing like some polynomial. Uh, the most typical one would just be linearly like I wrote down here. So we have some beta naught, beta one, and we have that um, there's a line and then there's some time series fluctuating all along that line. I should say a stationary ARMA process um, fluctuating above and below that line. Um, so then the thought process is, um, if that's the case, then if I were to take a first difference of YT, something that we kind of did in the first assignment or you kind of did in the first assignment, um, then what you end up with is something that's going to look like beta 1 plus xt minus xt minus 1. So we basically lose the constant term beta naught and then beta 1 goes from being a slope to being like a constant term. Um, and this is now stationary and it happens to be, I guess, some arma process. Strictly speaking, I don't know off the top of my head if it's going to be ARMA PQ. I'd have to think about that for a second um, because we have XT minus XT minus one. So the terms could, uh, odd things could happen if you take the terms, you offset them by one time unit and you start subtracting them. Um, but we're not going to worry about that for this example. The point is that we would be back in some in we would have some type of ARMA process. Of course, there would be a non-zero mean, which would correspond to beta one, um, or you know, something like that. Anyway, this gets into the idea of the ARIMA process or the auto regressive integrated for I integrated moving average process 
moving average process. So I never really interesting why they would say integrated. I assume they mean integrated because we're actually going to be applying a first difference operator d times. So if we were to, in some sense, undo the differencing, it would be like we're integrating to get the process that we uh, are studying. But effectively, the intuition is that if we keep applying some differences, uh, we'll eventually get down to a uh, stationary ARMA process by differencing out the trend um, however many times we have to do a difference. If it's linear, we do one difference. If it's quadratic, we do two and so on. Um, if we're dealing with real data, even if it has a higher power trend, probably one or two differences would be enough to kind of kill it out, kill out the trend um, anyway. So what are we doing? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to say, recall that delta D is going to equal one minus B to the D is the dth order difference operator operator there we go so we have that thing um and we can apply it to i guess xt um so the thought process is that um xt is arima p d q if delta d xt is I guess arma pq yes so that's the setup the idea is that we actually want to do d differences and then after those differences are done we're left with an arma pq process so mathematically what does this look like well what this looks like is going to be well in terms of operators we're going to have phi of b the autoregressive piece now we're going to have a delta or i guess a nabla the upside down triangle to the dth power applied to xt um, and we're going to have our moving average piece here theta b applied to the white noise so now we have the integrated so the autoregressive integrated moving average pieces, A R I M A spells Arima. All right. So in this case, again, um, we can assume zero mean. Um, I guess we can work through that just to show what happens because there's not really much more to tell us, tell you about the ARIMA process, except that we're doing these differences to um, get rid of any sort of deterministic trend. So very often in statistics, when we're looking at time series data, we'll want to take a first or a second difference to get to a stationary process and then fit an ARMA model to it. Um, or you can use the nifty function auto.arima, which will just do it all for you. Um, and we'll, of course, talk about all of these things in later lectures. But for now, I'm just going to talk about the mean, and then that looks about enough for, I think, a good, solid, tedious theoretical lecture. So um, I'll say we assume for convenience if I'm spelling that right, which I'm pretty sure I'm not, um, that the dth difference of xt is mean zero. And I'll say if not, then we can kind of work our way backwards and shove a mean into this equation. Um, if not, we have that um, phi, capital phi of B applied to, um, well, 
maybe I'll just write it out as one minus B. This is just the differencing operator written in terms of the backshift operator. Sometimes it's nicer to look at it that way. Um, anyway, we have that. And then we're going to have two pieces on the left hand side or the right hand side, sorry, the right hand side. We're going to have mu one minus the sum i from one to p of phi i. Uh, and then we're going to add to that capital theta b applied to wt. So now we have our mean here. And yeah, the idea being that if we sort of difference this out, then we would have, I guess, that mean still in the equation. Yeah, I'm not sure. There's nothing too much more, I think, to say about this right now. Right, so I think that's more or less what I'm not going to keep uh, rambling on here in, in front of the camera. Um, effectively, that's all we really need for the autoregressive integrated moving average. Everything that we did before kind of can just translate through to this thing. So we talked about the AR, the MA, and the ARMA process. The ARMA process has two key pieces to it, or two key properties, and that's going to be the causal representation and that it's invertible in the sense so that the moving average piece is uh, invertible. And then what we'll want to do is we'll want to consider the ARIMA process, which is really just the same thing, but in some sense integrated by throwing on some deterministic polynomial trend. Um, because now mathematically what we end up doing is we end up differencing out that trend. And then we can, um, after differencing it out, we would end up trying to fit coefficients to the ARMA process, the ARMA PQ process, and all of the same things would translate through. We would want to have an ARIMA process that has that causal and invertible representation. This is really important for estimating the terms because it's gonna mean that the terms in our model will be unique and we have a nice way of actually writing them down because again, there's so many different equivalent ways to write down these models mathematically. We need to make sure we only have one way to write them down so that that's the thing we're going to estimate. And at least in this case, if we restrict it to being causal, we restrict it to be invertible and all that, and we restrict the um, ARMA to be re irreducible in the sense that we don't have the same roots on the left hand side and on the right hand side, then we have something we can actually work with statistically. And that's what we're going to do in the next lecture or two. Um, I think. In my notes, the next thing I'm going to talk about is autocorrelation and partial autocorrelation. But um, I think it might be nicer just to jump in and actually show some examples of the ARMA and the ARIMA process first. And then we'll get back and do some autocorrelation. Because again, this whole course is basically ARMA and autocorrelation um, and a little bit of other stuff along the way. So anyway, that's it for today. See you in the next lecture. Mm -hmm.